Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Emily Hinchcliffe. Dr. Inchcliffe is an attending physician in the Division of GYN Oncology, both at NM Lake Forest and at Prentice Women's Hospital in downtown Chicago. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. And I will be moderating and introducing our speakers for the morning session. Um, I am pleased to introduce our first presenter, um, who unfortunately could not be with us this morning, but has recorded his talk and will hopefully be with us later this um, morning to do the question and answer session. Um, Dr. Alok Pont. Dr. Pont is a gynecologic oncologist at Northwestern Medicine Lake Forest Hospital, and he will be discussing integrative medicine in gynecologic oncology. Welcome, Dr. Pont. Good morning. My name is Alok Pant. I'm a GYN oncologist uh, up at Lake Forest Hospital. I um, just want to welcome everybody uh, to the event today. Um, it's a real privilege, a real honor to be able to speak at this event um, every year. Uh, so thanks to Dr. Tanner, to the program committee, to everybody who worked so hard to, to put this on. And um, most of all, thank you to the patients and the caregivers who are joining us today. I hope you guys find this um, educational, helpful, um, enlightening. I know I certainly did while doing research for this topic. Um, so I have been given the uh, privilege of talking about, or the topic is integrative oncology. And I try to change it up each year, something um, relevant to our patients and, and, and their needs and, and the caregivers. And um, so this year I decided to talk about medical marijuana. You know, it's something that we all get asked about. Um, I would say, hey, maybe not on a daily basis, but but pretty frequently by, by a lot of patients, a lot of caregivers. Um, there's a lot of information, misinformation out there. Um, sometimes it can be hard to know exactly what's real, what's not. Um, and so I thought I'd try to go about this in a real evidence-based way as we do with um, most things in medicine to really see like what's, what's actually valid and, and what's not and how helpful can this uh, intervention be for people. So with that, I'll uh, go ahead and get started. All right. So the history of marijuana, also known as cannabis in medicine. Um, so there was a Chinese emperor in the 28th century BC um, who happened to note the medical benefits of cannabis, Chinese emperor Shen Nung. Um, then fast forward to the 1840s, there's a Dr. Shaughnessy is a surgeon um, and he noted analgesic properties, meaning marijuana was a good pain reliever. It was an appetite stimulant um, and it also helped people sleep. And it was actually fairly frequently prescribed for labor pain and nausea um, in the 1800s. Now, in this country, the Harrison Act, which was in 1914, actually outlawed the use of marijuana. Um, and then in 1970, in this country, the FDA um, made marijuana a Schedule I drug, meaning it was at high risk of abuse. So it's kind of in line with things like cocaine and heroin. Um, and it actually remains that today. Um, California legalized the use of medical cannabis for patients with cancer and AIDS back in 1996. Um, and as of April 2021, <clears throat> medical use is now legal in 36 states in this country. Pretty remarkable, actually. So what is the actual role of cannabis in oncology? I think there's a few different um, subcategories where it oftentimes really gets a lot of prominence. So first and foremost, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, um, obviously a common issue cancer-associated pain, its use as an appetite stimulant, use as a sleep aid, and then this is where things get really controversial um, in terms of its uh, actual cancer treatment effects. So how, how does marijuana or cannabis work? Well, essentially there's three different bioactive molecules. There's flavonoids, terpenoids, and cannabinoids. The most well-studied cannabinoid is delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, otherwise known as THC, which most people have heard of. Now, um, there is actually an endogenous cannabinoid receptor system, meaning throughout our body, there are actually receptors dedicated to um, marijuana and its components. So there's cannabinoid one receptors, CB1 receptors, which are located throughout the body. They are most highly concentrated in the central nervous system. So in the brain and the spinal cord. Cannabinoid 2 receptors are actually mainly found in the immune system. Um, so THC acts on the CB1 receptors. Um, cannabis also has another um, molecule that most people have heard of these days called CBD or cannabidiol, CBD. Um, and this is where um, CBD works on the cannabinoid 2 receptors in the immune system. 
So this is non-psychotropic, meaning it doesn't give that sort of high feeling, that euphoria. Um, it is, however, a potent anti-inflammatory agent, which certainly um, can play a significant role um, for folks with cancer. So THC versus CBD. Um, so THC, um, there are certain strains of marijuana. There's two, two main strains. One is called sativa. Um, it's a type of cannabis plant. Um, this is the type that is the high that is associated with these plants are um, uplifting, they're energizing cerebral effects, that euphoria effect. Um, with that also comes a little bit of a higher risk for some paranoia, um, like anxiety that can come with that. And then there's the indica strains of marijuana. This also is a THC dominant um, type of cannabis. This is the much more sedating, um, relaxing type of marijuana. And then these days they have what they call hybrid strains, which are essentially GMOs, genetically modified organisms, where they have bred these plants together. Um, of course, now it's going to become a pretty big business. Um, CBD is only mildly mood altering. It's non-psychotropic. There's minimal intoxication. It has that anti-inflammatory effect. Um, and there are, there are plenty of THC and CBD combinations as well um, currently available. So moving to chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. This is obviously a, a significant problem um, for people going through chemotherapy and dealing with cancer. So everybody knows about carboplatin, um, essentially a ubiquitous part of ovarian cancer treatment and most gynecologic malignancies. Carboplatin is categorized as moderately to severely emetogenic, meaning it, it certainly has the ability to cause a fair amount of nausea. Now, this is where things get kind of interesting here. So THC will affect the 5-HT3 receptor, okay? What's really interesting is that Zofran and Aloxy, which essentially are standard parts of the um, carbotaxol regimen as anti-nausea medications, are actually 5-HT3 receptor antagonists. That's how they work via this receptor. Um, and that's why there's a lot of crossover with THC. Dronabinol, which is a synthetic THC, it's an oral agent, is currently approved for chemo-induced nausea vomiting that's not controlled by conventional um, medications. In Canada, they have an oral spray called Sativex. Um, I'm probably pronouncing that uh, incorrectly, but it's an oral spray that contains THC and CBD used for chemo-induced nausea vomiting. So there's a phase two randomized so throughout this, I've tried to find actual studies um, where they have actually studied this, not just, you know, oh, I heard this works really well for my cousin and this, that, the other, but actual trials that were done. Um, so this is a phase two study, a randomized control trial um, published last year coming out of Australia and New Zealand. So there were 81 patients undergoing chemotherapy, um, and they were treated um, with an oral mixture of THC and CBD, dexamethasone, so a steroid along with the 5-HT3 agonist, um, it was ondansetron or Sofran. So what they found was that when people received the THC and CBD in addition to these standard agents, there was an improvement in the anti-nausea effects from 14% to 25%. Now, 72% of the cannabis users, or the cannabinoid users, I should say, um, still required additional anti-nausea medication. Almost a third of the patients were still throwing up, um, and a third of the patients did complain of significant sedation, dizziness, and disorientation. But based on these somewhat promising results, a, a phase three, so a larger scale study is um, currently planned. Now, this is a, a review of 28 studies of chemo-induced nausea vomiting. So there are a little more than 1,700 patients on this study. Um, and so it had um, all different regimens being compared essentially with these oral cannabinoids. They were compared to Compazine or Zofran and other standard nausea medications. What was found in most of the studies and kind of in a summation in the review was that there was a trend towards uh, an improvement in um, nausea bombing with the use of these cannabinoids, but, the, but that improvement was actually not statistically significant. Um, and they did note significantly more sedation, dizziness, fatigue, hallucination, and dry mouth. So it's the kind of thing that, well, this study doesn't say, you know what, wow, this was a home run. It definitely made everything a lot better. No, not, not really, actually. Um, two of the studies did show a significant combination when the cannabinoid um, was used in combination with uh, composine. Okay. And then there was um, one study where it compared directly against Zofran, and it showed no improvement whatsoever. 
okay, this is another review study from 2016, a little more than 1,300 patients. So two of these oral cannabinoid um, agents versus standard um, oral nausea medications. So what they, what they noted was that there was a significant improvement in chemotherapy regimens that would be considered moderately emetogenic. So things that, that certainly um, had a moderate amount of nausea associated with it, those chemotherapy drugs, including um, cytoxin, methotrexate, and um, 5-FU. Now, there wasn't any improvement, though, in the more highly emetogenic regimen. So those regimens that cause a lot of nausea, the use of these um, oral cannabinoids didn't really seem to make any um, improvement. So that non-therapeutic effects, euphoria, sedation, and drowsiness. There was also dizziness, depression, hallucinations, paranoia, and low blood pressure. Now, what's interesting is that they also asked a bunch of these patients, I guess, um, would you like to use this for future chemotherapy regimens? And depending on the study that you looked at, 38 to 90% of patients actually said that, yes, they would um, like to have this with future chemo cycles. So the next topic, um, cancer-associated pain. Um, so pain is very common uh, in cancer patients. Up to 90% of patients with advanced cancer will complain of pain. Um, now, the cannabinoid 1 receptor, which is the, um, the one that THC acts on, like I said, it's found in the central nervous system, and it also is found in areas that are involved in nociceptive processing, so like physical damage, painful stimuli, this is as opposed to like neuropathic pain, like neuropathy. Um, and then these cannabinoids um, can also act on mast cell receptors via the, um, the CB2 receptor. So this is how um, CBD will affect um, affect the tissue via the mast cells. Um, and this works by inhibiting the release of inflammatory substances. So mast cells are oftentimes involved in like um, massive, like uh, inflammatory cascades or massive allergic responses. And so the CBD seems to inhibit that on some level. What's interesting also is that these cannabinoids seem to have some type of synergistic um, pain relieving effect with narcotics. And I think it's not really 100% .100 understood why that is. So there's a trial from 1975. It's a double-blind placebo control study. Um, small study, but um, interesting. So they were studying um, the pain relief effects of THC at 15 and 20 milligrams. And what they found was that at those doses, it was significantly better than not getting anything at all. Okay. What they did find was that um, at that doses, there was a significant amount of sedation. Okay. So the next step in the trial, they... Um, uh, enrolled 36 patients, and they used THC given at 10 and 20 milligrams versus codeine given at 60 and 120 milligrams, which are fairly hefty doses of codeine. Um, what they found was that the, the pain relief effect of 10 milligrams of THC was actually comparable to 60 milligrams of codeine, and then 20 milligrams of THC was comparable to 120 milligrams of codeine. Um, what they did find was that when the doses of THC were higher, it became more sedating than codeine, actually. Um, so using uh, a combination of THC and CBD for pain control, how well does that work? So Johnson et al. in 2010, um, they performed a study in 177 patients with advanced cancer who had uncontrolled pain despite long-term narcotic use. There were three arms in the study, so there was a, an extract that had both the THC and the CBD in it versus the THC on its own versus just placebo, so nothing. Um, what they found was that in the combination group, the THC and CBD, there was a 30% improvement in, um, in pain scores versus uh, placebo, so, and this was a statistically significant result. Uh, Schleider et al. in 2018 um, studied over a thousand patients, and what they found was this: so before using any kind of cannabis um, or marijuana, 53% of these patients um, had pain scores um, from eight to 10 out of 10, so pretty severe pain. Um, and after six months of cannabis use, uh, only 5% reported pain at that intensity. It's pretty dramatic, um, and the quality of life scores improved significantly from 19% to 70%. Um, there was a, a review published in 2019 of 300 patients um, with cancer, and what they showed was that with regular cannabis use, they noted a 64% reduction in the amount of opioid use. So pretty remarkable, actually. So this is um, this is where things get controversial. Well, 
probably been controversial for a while here, but um, essentially, so does cannabis work as a cancer treatment? Um, we all get we all get asked these questions. I would imagine um, all of the the um, providers on this on this um, symposium have also been asked about things like the Rick Simpson oil. Um, patients have probably heard about this. Um, so. What has been found in um, lab studies, right? So in the laboratory, that cannabinoid signaling is increased in some cancers um, compared to benign tissue, and it seems as though the more invasive the cancer is, there seems to be more cannabinoid signaling. Um, lab and tissue culture studies have shown that cannabinoids can actually inhibit tumor growth um, by inducing with uh, apoptosis or programmed cell death and suppressing the ability of a cell to divide. Um, there was a study, um, this is a laboratory study that showed that actually THC might actually increase tumor growth because it impacts the uh, immune system pretty significantly. So a little bit more from lab and mice studies, because this is, this is really where the bulk of this comes from, quite frankly. Um, so one group um, essentially published a study looking at mice with lung cancer who were given oral THC, and it actually slowed down the tumor growth. Um, Another, another group, Sanchez et al., they demonstrated that giving um, the CB2 agonist, so the, like the CBD version, um, uh, to mice actually caused brain tumors to shrink based on MRI results. Um, and then another study also looking at CBD um, uh, showed that there was a 40 to 50 percent reduction in tumor growth um, and a 65 to 80 percent reduction in lung mets, which is also pretty remarkable. Now, keep in mind, this is all um, this is in mice. Okay. Um, I could only find one study published in um, actual humans. This was in 2006, and so this was this was in patients. Um, this was nine patients with recurrent glioblastoma, um, so like a really aggressive uh, type of brain cancer, who had um, progressed despite having had surgery and radiation. And what they did was they actually um, intracranially administered THC to these nine patients. What they found was that in two patients, the THC actually did decrease tumor growth and progression, but these numbers are really small. Um, there wasn't a control group. There's no. There wasn't any discussion about survival time. So it's hard to really say if this is something that's actually um, a viable option. I, I would say as of right now, there is no um, evidence that it actually does work from a cancer treatment standpoint. Um, so a big issue with um, with cancer and and with treatment is um, appetite, is decreased appetite. So what's been found, so the CB1 receptors, which are the, the THC um, or THC acts in the central nervous system and in fat tissue actually are involved in appetite, re appetite regulation. Um, and so what's been shown is that the use of THC actually increases orosensory reward pathways and enjoyment of food. Um, this is colloquially known as the munchies. Um, now, the National Academy of Science in 2017 didn't find enough evidence um, in cancer patients um, that this works uh, as an appetite stimulant. That being said, there was subsequently a study in 2018 that did show a 62% um, of the patients reported an improvement in their appetite after six months of cannabis use. Um, There's a study published in 2019 in 1,000 patients, um, and in that, so almost 40% of patients had at least a 30% improvement after four months of cannabis use. Okay, so how much of a role does this play in sleep, fatigue, anxiety, and depression? Um, so what's interesting is that there have been um, animal studies that have been done, and it's shown that this endogenous cannabinoid receptor system is actually um, fairly significantly involved in the regulation of circadian rhythms, which is kind of like our sleep-wake cycle. Um, so this is a study published in 2018 in um, 2,300 cancer patients. Um, so what they found was this, was that problems with sleep, essentially insomnia, um, completely resolved in 17% of patients after cannabis use. 71% um, of patients noted some improvement, and 12% said there was no difference. Um, it was interesting. Um, fatigue completely resolved in 11% of these patients. 56% of patients noted um, a significant improvement, but a third of these patients said, you know, there wasn't any difference. Um, anxiety and depression completely resolved in 10% of patients on this study. 74% of patients noted improvement. 16% um, said, you know what, I don't really feel any different. Okay, so how safe is cannabis? Um, 
So THC is, um, has been found to be more sedating than opiates, than narcotics, um, but it isn't associated with respiratory depression. And that's what we worry about with, um, with narcotics. Is essentially, it lowers somebody's respiratory drive. This is how people overdose on narcotics. They stop breathing. Okay, a fatal overdose from marijuana is almost impossible. I didn't put down the number here what, um, in, the, in the research that I came across. Essentially, the, um, the value, and this seemed too outlandish, and I found a way to corroborate this, but what, the, what this study said was that extrapolating from animal studies, the fatal dose in humans would be um, essentially smoking um, 600 grams um, in 15 minutes, which is a lot, um, so almost a kilogram. Um, now, in terms of safety of cannabis, so adverse and non-therapeutic effects, um, euphoria, disorientation, drowsiness, dizziness, motor incoordination, tachycardia, low blood pressure, and poor concentration. Um, now, this, this is a, an important point here. The risk of dependence, so getting addicted to cannabis, um, is the risk is about nine to 20% in long-term users. Um, this is found. This is significantly lower than the addiction rates of heroin, cocaine, alcohol, and um, prescribed anxiety medications like um, like uh, Ativan and Xanax. So, how does one take cannabis? There's not really any recommended dosing because this is not an FDA-approved um, medication per se. But essentially, the, um, the thought is to start low and go slow. Um, the question becomes the ratio of the THC to the CBD that's used. So that's like the euphoria appetite stimulation versus the anti-inflammatory effects. Um, a very popular way of ingesting this is with oral agents, so the edibles or the gummies. Um, this is thought to be, these are long acting um, agents. They're better for chronic conditions. Um, it takes about 30 minutes to an hour and a half to um, start to work. Peaks one to six hours and it lasts four to eight hours. Recommended dosing two to 60 milligrams. The immediate acting, the vaping or the smoking, I put a question mark there because I don't think anybody would recommend anybody smoke. Um, this is used for symptom breakthroughs, so for more like um, acute symptoms. So this essentially um, start with one puff, wait 15 minutes. Usually it'll start to work five seconds to 10 minutes. Um, takes about five to 10 minutes to really kick in and then can last for two to four hours. One, um, one thing I found in this one journal is that they said that for people who are, I guess, prior users of cannabis and have not used it now for a while. They said to be careful because apparently um, marijuana, the THC content in the early 90s was about 4%. And um, when they measured this in 2018, it's up to 15%. So it's much, much, much more potent. Um, and then, you know, there are dispensaries all over Illinois and they have experts there who are ready and willing to assist with those specifics of, of the dosing. So in terms of um, Illinois medical cannabis, this was started in 2013. The Illinois Department of Public Health is, are the ones who regulate that. Um, here's a, there's an email address. Um, there's a website, essentially. There's an application process. Um, your physician can certify it. So we, as, as Northwestern doctors, um, we are not allowed to prescribe it, but we can say, yes, this individual has cancer and would benefit from it. Um, the application process does have of two avenues um, with and without a caregiver. Um, this is not covered by insurance. Um, so that's something important to keep in mind. But essentially what happens is that the taxes that one pays on the medical marijuana are significantly lower than what the recreational users um, will pay. And then, like I said, there are dispensaries um, all throughout Illinois. So um, I hope you guys enjoyed the talk and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Um, once again, it's a privilege to talk to everybody and um, thank you.